Welcome back to DC to Daylight. I'm Derek, and in this video, I want to combine two topics we recently covered, tank circuits and diodes. We're going to take these two concepts and make a very simple crystal radio. Now, don't switch that channel just yet. We're going to use this project as an excuse to learn a little bit about modulation, how a diode detector works, and we'll look at VI curves of germanium, silicon, and uh, old-timey galena crystals, which are all used to turn an amplitude-modulated signal into an audible one. We'll do a quick teardown of a radio from the early 1920s, and we'll make our own using a variable capacitor and an inductor that we're going to wind on a drill. The idea here is not to throw some plans at you and say, go copy what I did. The goal is to provide you with the knowledge to make your own and select whatever components will work for you or whatever you have laying around. That sounds like a good time to me, so please stick around and let's go make a crystal radio. So here's a good example of a radio from the early 20s, 1924 to be exact. Um, the company is Steinite Laboratories. This um, I found online and thought it was a great example of an old radio from back in the day and I absolutely love this logo. So my understanding is they're no longer in business, um, but they did produce uh, for a while these Galena diodes. Uh, they call them Steinite crystals. They're not actually Steinite crystal, just a brand name. They are a lead sulfide crystal. We'll take a closer look at that in a second. The functionality of this is pretty simple. We have a tuned circuit, um, and if you've watched our tank circuit video, you'll know how they work. And I've seen designs where they have them in series and parallel, but we have a capacitor here in parallel with an inductor, and we can switch off different taps. It just makes contact with uh, different portions of the coil underneath we'll, we'll look at. Uh, your antenna connects here, um, usually a dipole, right, or a, maybe a quarter wave vertical. Uh, your, your center conductor will be connected here, or one leg of your dipole, the other will be connected to ground. Uh, being that this is for the AM broadcast band, you would have a very long wire, but any random length would work to pick up local stations. On the other end here, you'd connect your, uh, you know, granddad's earpiece, and um, that would just connect between the photo terminals and this. So this goes to basically ground and connects to one side of our tank circuit. And then this side goes to our diode and this side goes to the funnel output. There's really not much of the circuitry to speak of. So let's look inside. Pretty basic construction, like I said, all the grounds connected across here, okay, for your headphones and the ground of the antenna. And then this is your planar coil, right? I think this is called a basket weave, um, and it just taps off uh, at that switch on the front side. And the capacitor is really interesting, so check this out. I think this is called a book capacitor, and the way it works is as I rotate this knob, uh, it actuates this cam, and that roller just pushes those two plates closer together or further apart. So. <laughs> You can imagine there'd be some frequency drift with this kind of a design, but you know, it just uh, explains a little bit about the technology that was available back then and what people would actually buy. So here's the schematic of what we're going to build today. I'm kind of taking the same approach as the radio we just looked at. Instead of the Galena diode, we're going to use a semiconductor diode, germanium, not silicon, because germanium turns on at 0.3 volts typically instead of the 0.7 that you'd see with a silicon diode, so it's more sensitive, though they're not very easy to find nowadays. Um, on the left hand side, I have my inductors. This will be my main inductor that's always going to be switched in the circuit. And uh, I'm shooting for about 250 microhenries. You can see here I've put down 245 because I actually measured them after the fact that I wound it. And two 100 microhenry sections here. And they measured about 113 and 98. I guess I put a little extra few turns on this one. So anyway, we can switch between uh, this lower inductor, these two inductors here, or if we switch to this position, all three inductors. And that gives us a little bit more flexibility, changes our bandwidth a little bit, and we'll look at the calculations in a second. So also we have this capacitor, all right? I have a transmitter capacitor, um, and you can use whatever you can find. And typically values range from 20 to 150 picofarads. That's very common for tuning capacitors. And of course, you'd have to adjust your inductors uh, to whatever range you wanted, okay? The antenna connects to the top side of this resonant circuit. This is a tank circuit, and the output goes to a detector diode. And what that's going to do is take the RF out of that signal, basically, and, and rectify it as well as kind of fill in the gaps. And it does require some capacitance in order to filter it out and make an audible signal. Our old man uh, earphone that we have connected to the output has some capacitance, and we can also connect a, say, 0.1 or 0.01 uh, microfarad capacitor of the output to aid in that. Um, you'd have to kind of characterize uh, your diode and capacitor and you may want to put a little resistance across that too to help shape the waveform. Anyway, this is our schematic and I'll show you the equation that I use to calculate uh, how many turns for this inductor and uh, we'll go through the resonant formula calculation again just so you know the ranges uh, min and max for particular values like this. 
So no semiconductor video would be complete if we didn't use our poor man's curve tracer to show the different types of diodes on our oscilloscope. So I can measure the voltage and current across the diode, plot them in X, Y on the scope. And uh, what we'll do, I've got some leads connected here. So first we'll connect them to a germanium diode. This is the diode that I'm actually gonna use for my radio. So you can see we start connecting it about 0 0.2, 0 0.4 volts between there. So yeah, that's why a germanium diode is more sensitive. It starts to conduct you know, pretty much just above zero volts. So now we're gonna connect our silicon diode. And you can see it, it starts to conduct just a little bit later than, a little bit more voltage than the uh, germanium diode. So it's not as sensitive. Um, it doesn't make a huge difference, but it does make some difference when you're trying to listen to faraway stations. Nearby stations, you can use whatever you want. And lastly, we will use our Galena diode to see what kind of characteristics this possesses. Make sure our crystal's tightened in there with that screw, and then we'll kind of poke around until we make good contact. I did not expect to see that. So it actually performs close to or even less than the germanium diode. So it conducts pretty early, uh, but you see the slope here, that's an actual internal resistance, um, either from the, the bad connections or the crystal itself. So this actually is a pretty good performer, comparatively speaking. So one of the things that you have to do when you're making a crystal radio is you've got to wind an inductor. So I wanted to put myself kind of in the middle of the AM broadcast band, which is about, uh, I believe it goes from 550 kilohertz up to six, uh, sorry, 1700 kilohertz. So I chose these values to kind of put me in the middle of that range with the capacitor that I have. Uh, we need to know the um, air core inductance calculation. So this is it. And this is generally found when winding single layer air core inductors that are close wound, okay? One winding right up against the next. So the inductance that you'll end up with ballpark is going to be the diameter of the tubing, okay? Squared, multiplied by the number of turns in that coil squared divided by 18 times the diameter plus 40 in the length in inches. So this formula is in inches um, as I have marked here on my schematic. There are dozens of calculators online. You can just switch between imperial and metric and uh, that's probably the easiest way to go about doing this. Um, but I chose 105 turns which would give me 250 microhenries and that came out pretty accurate when I measured it. Now I had a three position switch so I thought that I would add a couple more windings that would give me a little bit more of a range. So I shot for 60 microhenries according to this calculation. When I actually wound it on the core, I ended up with about 100 each, okay, with 40 turns. So I'm not really sure if that's because I used a carbon fiber tube for the um, coil form. And it's actually kind of a no-no to use carbon fiber when you're uh, manufacturing antennas because it does absorb some of the RF. So I don't know if there's like a permeability thing going on with these uh, smaller sections or if this formula is actually less accurate uh, the lower the number of windings that you have. But anyway, empirically, I came up with this. Mathematically and measuring, I actually got around 250. So just be aware of that when you're doing these calculations. Always actually wind it and then measure yourself so you know what you're getting into. So here is the tank circuit part of our radio. We have our inductors, our switch, and we have our capacitor. That capacitor ranges from 20 to 150 picofarads. So we know that the resonant frequency is one over two pi times the square root of inductance times capacitance, or LC. We've covered that in a couple of videos now. I don't wanna get into that, but that is the formula for finding the resonance of an LC circuit. So I went ahead and created a table here just so that I could see where my center frequency was at the extremes when I have the capacitor turned all the way down and turned all the way up and uh, for each of these switching ranges. So this top uh, row is this bottom coil by itself, second row is both coils, and this last row is all three coils connected in series. So you can see I get 2250 kilohertz, 822 kilohertz, that gives me a bandwidth of 1428, and so on and so forth. What you can see from this chart is as I switch in more and more inductance, the bandwidth actually decreases each time I do that, okay? And you'll notice that my frequency shifts lower and lower at the same time. So interesting to know, I just thought this would give me a little bit more of a range and it does a couple hundred kilohertz on the low end, just kind of shifts it down, but I don't think it was all that necessary. I probably could have just put one long winding in here and I would have still been able to pick up and broadcast uh, frequencies. 
So that's how I came to these numbers. And let's go ahead and we will, we'll uh, dust this thing off. We'll connect an antenna to it. I have about 30 feet of wire that I'm gonna connect to this and uh, run it all the way across my house. And I also have this uh, little jumper here that I'm gonna connect to the other terminal. And this is our ground lead, okay? So that connects to my uh, ground and my house wiring. So that should give us plenty of length. Hopefully there's nothing noisy on the circuit uh, and we'll be able to listen to this. Oh, by the way, for folks that are curious about the germanium diode used, uh, it is a 1N34. Not that common nowadays. Um, not many people use germanium, but uh, you can still find it um, in your usual online places. Watch out for counterfeits though. So I wanna show just what AM signals look like on uh, my ham radio here. It's pretty good at uh, displaying what's actually RF, you know, spectrally what's out there. So these are the AM stations that are, are I can pick up from my antenna out in my backyard. And you can see one particular station that's really loud, and it's this one right here. Um, so if I attenuate all the other signals, you can still see that this is just blasting through. Let's increase, let's zoom in a little bit, and you can see what an AM station looks like. So this guy is just blasting away, and I found out that uh, two miles away from my house, there's actually this radio station. It is 10.30 AM. It's, um, I guess it's um, Spanish music and uh, it's 45 kilowatts. So here's a look at that. I just took a spin down there to see uh, what was happening. And uh, pretty interesting that it's you know right in our backyard. The sensitivity of this particular radio we're looking at right here is extremely good. This is a mixture of a heterodyne uh, where you mix multiple frequencies together. I can take that output of the heterodyne and uh, sample it directly and turn it into software, then do DSP processing on it and all kinds of magical stuff. Uh, but the crystal radio that we have, the Q of the tank circuit is pretty bad. There's really poor selectivity, so we're probably gonna pick up multiple stations at the same time. Definitely, I don't think it matters what frequency we're at because this station is so loud, we're going to pick up this no matter what. Let's give our crystal radio a chance to prove itself and we'll see how it sounds. All right, so the last step is to see how this sounds. I'm just kind of tuning through each of those inductance ranges. And I think all of the inductors um, being in circuit actually aids in, you know, like we looked at in that table, the selectivity. Once I get a station finally tuned in, um, you can kind of hear the sound quality of a crystal radio and it's pretty terrible. So you can hear that we're picking up multiple stations because the Q of the tank circuit is so low. Um, we don't have a lot of selectivity, so multiple stations are coming through at the same time. January is a big hiring season. If you're tired of quiet quitting and ready to find the career you were created for, or ready to find more it's crazy. And uh, that's just, that's the limitation of this particular circuit. I think if we use a different configuration for the coil, increase the inductance while decreasing the series resistance, we would increase the Q of the coil and have more selectivity. Plans changing and deductibles are resetting. A lot of you might be looking at higher out-of-pocket costs in the new year. That's why I recommend... But there you go, the glorious sounds of a crystal radio. Millions of people save on prescription medication. Although it is pretty amazing that we can pick up these stations with a completely passive circuit. You know, no external DC voltage required. All right, that wraps up this episode of DC to Daylight. Um, it was a lot of fun making this radio over here. Um, and I know there are a lot of you that are experts in crystal radios, I know it's a thing. Um, I thought with the knowledge that I had, I would try to make something that kind of paralleled uh, the Steinite radio that we looked at. So I know there are a lot of things about this radio that are not ideal, and I know that there are specific things we can do to the circuit to increase the performance, like especially when it comes to the inductor. Um, so I challenge you to uh, engage with us and teach me, teach the community about how we can make this thing better. What can I do to make this a better radio? So we can't necessarily do so much in the comments, but if you click the link down below in the description, then you can interact with me more, educate me and other people. Also, if you have any kind of crystal radio, I like looking at old gear like that. So anything, you know, from the 20s, 30s, it doesn't even matter. I would love to see the radios that you have built. It doesn't even have to be a crystal radio or old gear. Hit me down in the link and uh, I would love to take a look at it and just uh, interact with me there. Anyway, you can catch up with me in the Element 14 community. All right, I will see you next time. Have a good one.